So in this lecture, we're going to do one thing, which is we're going to write down uh, the Langevin equation, derive it in a heuristic fashion. Um, we won't solve it, however. The so solution will be for, for next um, next uh, video. Okay, so there's, there's Paul Langevin, after whom the Langevin equation is named. That's a drawing by Picasso. All right, so... Um, Paul Langevin uh, was born in 1872 and he lived until 1946. Um, so he's a child of uh, the Belle Epoque, which is a period of history from about um, the Franco-Prussian War in about 1870 to the start of the First World War in 1914. Um, and during that period, um, at least in Europe, uh, in the United States as well, there was a great sense of optimism, a great sense of progress. Uh, there was a love of beauty uh, and... Um, a, a, a sense that mankind was going somewhere. Um, now, this might seem very alien to people um, who have been born, say, in the year 2000, uh, because uh, for the first 20 years of this century, um, there have been, basically, it's been pessimism. Everyone's either a sexist or a racist or a homophobe or a transphobe, or if you're not any of those, you're responsible for massive climate change. And... But it is possible to live in a world where people are optimistic, and this is the world in which Paul Langevin was uh, uh, found himself. Um, and he was, um, like Marie Curie, a student of Pierre Curie, um, and he was also a student of J.J. Thompson, so he's educated both in Cambridge uh, and in Paris, and of course he's a Frenchman originally, and did most of his work in France. So... Um, the other interesting thing about Paul Langevin is that after Pierre Curie's tragic death, um, uh, Marie and Paul, Marie Curie and Paul became lovers, uh, and um, Langevin, who was still married at the time, uh, his wife was unimpressed, uh, and there were jewels thwart, thwart over it. Um, and uh, now Marie and Paul never had any children together; they didn't, they didn't get married. Um, but one set of their grandchildren got married. So here's, you know, here's the French newspaper at the time: uh, a history of love. Marie Curie and Madame de Paul Langevin. So, that's enough of uh, Langevin's biography. Um, what about, what are we talking about here? Well, what did Langevin do? So we've looked at Metropolis Monte Carlo, which is, which gives us a method of looking at equilibrium system mechanics. So it basically reproduces partition functions and Boltzmann distributions, etc. So we can look at snapshots of the equilibrium configurations. So we look at snapshots using Metropolis Monte Carlo. Okay. But Metropolis Monte Carlo tells us absolutely nothing normally about dynamics, about how things move in statmex systems. And in fact, this course is mainly about uh, um, systems which are static. They're not moving. They're, not, they're always in equilibrium. But... Um, Langevin Dynamics gives us a handle on how things move, at least on the microscopic scale, and therefore on the macroscopic scale. Um, so, particularly for individual particles. Um, it's used sometimes analytically. So sometimes you can get solutions to the Langevin equation, which gives us, gives us things which are analytical, but more often it's used in computer simulations. Okay, it's very, very useful in simulations. Okay, so... Um, so, there we go. There's Langevin with, uh, well, first we're going to do Langevin with inertia. Okay, there's, there's a mass. Um, this is with his wife. This is his wife um, who is called uh, Emma Jean. Uh, um, so, there we go. So, first we're going to do Langevin with inertia. So, um, what do you, what does Langevin equation describe? Well, what we do is we're going to take a single particle, in, at least initially in 1D. You can generalize it to 3D very easily. Um, this particle has mass m, it's in a fluid surrounded by, by other stuff, by water or alcohol or some other sort of fluid. Um, and we've still got one particle, here it is, surrounded by a fluid, which is this stuff here. Um, and it's subjected to three kinds of forces. The first one is fluid drag, and we'll go through these one after another in more detail. So, you know, if you drag this through a fluid, you get some resistance, okay? Um, it might also be subjected to um, electric forces, if it's charged, gravity, if it has mass, or it's definitely got mass, um, molecular forces um, from molecules, so Leonard Jones, dispersion forces, van der Waals forces, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's also subject, and this is the most important thing here, to random molecular forces, random molecular bombardments, and it's constantly being hit by these other molecules. Okay, so this third one 
is really the contribution which um, which Langevin makes. Okay, and we're going to assume the system's more or less in equilibrium at a fixed temperature. So we're going to fix the temperature, um, and it's more or less in an equilibrium state. Although of course the thing's moving about all the time. So we're just asking, you know, in equilibrium, you know, how far is this particle going to go after ten seconds? Okay, that's the question. Okay, and you see, it's typically will do some random warp like this. Okay, so let's look at all these forces in more detail. The first one is the fluid drag. Okay, so if I have a particle in a fluid, uh, I either move it through the fluid or I um, allow the fluid to flow past it, it doesn't really matter. Um, you get a fluid drag force which is equal to um, the sum constant times the relative velocity of the particle in the fluid. Now, we're going to write this constant as m gamma, okay, um, and the, uh, the, thing, the important thing to realize here is that, um, in fact, gamma is proportional to 1 on m. So this m gamma thing is, in fact, independent of m. We just write the m in there for uh, reasons of, um, of simplicity. Okay, so it cancels out in the end. Okay, so for a spherical particle radius r, rs, um, in a fluid uh, of viscosity eta, this thing gamma is given by Stokes drag. So it's given by 6 times pi times the viscosity of the fluid times the radius of my sphere divided by the mass. Okay, as I said before, this mass term will drop out. Gamma m will be independent of mass. For a general particle, which might not be a sphere, you can always write gamma is equal to eta times w divided by m, where w is the size of the particle. Right? Okay. Um, and of course, this drag can depend on particle orientation. If you have a, a cube or something, you know, as much as a cube, I tried to... The drag, you know, figure out what the drag is. If you drag it that way, it's different from dragging it along a diagonal, obviously. But for a sphere, we don't have to worry about that. And most of the time, we'll just be dealing with spheres. We won't worry about particle orientation here. So, what other forces are likely to act on the system? Well, there are other deterministic forces. So this is a deterministic force. Basically, it's, it's not stochastic. This, this fluid drag is definitely deterministic. Okay, it's, it's given by the law which Mr. Stokes found in the 19th century. So other forces, um, well, um, they might be molecular bond forces. So in a polymer, you have these monomers here. There's a bead spring model of a polymer, and you have some forces, which here are, I mean, are springs, but of course they're chemical, they're chemical bonds. Um, you could have an electric field on the system if it's charged, there's a positive charge on that one, and there's an electric field force like that if you put a field in that direction. So you can have all these kind of gravitational forces. Normally, for these sorts of systems, gravity is is completely negligible, but in principle, you can have other deterministic forces of that kind. You can have intermolecular forces as well. Um, van der Waals forces, say, between those two molecules there. Okay. So, um, the really important thing here are the random forces. Mm -hmm. And these are due to molecular environment for all the other particles in the system. So you, you isolate one particle, which might be bigger than all the other particles, but might not be. Um, uh, and, you know, for instance, they could be, uh, this particle here could be an ion rather than just a water molecule, in which case it's roughly the same size as the water molecules, okay? Um, but it could be a much larger colloidal particle or something. So these uh, particular particles, uh, particular forces, are temperature forces in the sense that if you cool the system down to zero temperature, they go away, okay? And it turns out that we will see later on that they have a size proportional to the square root of the absolute temperature of the surrounding fluid. So they're random, but they have a size proportional to T. Square root of T. Okay. So we're going to write these forces as M times RT. So the F is the force, and we basically put a time here because it varies with time, they fluctuate over time. Um, M here is only for convenience again. Um, basically, it's going to drop out. M times RT is independent of M normally. Okay. And what we're looking at here is a model where we take one particle and we relegate all the other particles to a kind of C. And that C basically uh, does a whole lot of things, but one of the things it does is it introduces random forces. It also introduces the drag force, because, of course, the drag force on this particle, if I go through it, is... If I pull this particle along, it's basically caused by all the other particles. Okay, so this is typical in the dense matter physics. You concentrate on one particle and you relegate all the other particles to a kind of 
surrounding environment, which you sort of average over. Okay, and this particle here becomes our particle of interest. Okay, so um, then we can write down ultimately what the equation of motion is. And here's the equation of motion. Okay, it's just Newton's equation. Okay, it's mass times change in velocity, uh, which we're going to call our LT, and this is equal to all the sum of all the forces, fluid drag, random stuff, random forces, plus all the other bits and pieces, all the bits and pieces which might be deterministic, which are deterministic, which electric field forces, molecular forces, um, uh, gravity, etc., etc., etc. And next video, we will go and um, and uh, solve that equation in, in certain cases.